some ways many lives have touched so many different groups of people, many of whom are here today, of course, his family and his many, many friends from Tasmania, people he worked with and befriended all over Australia and here and from overseas. I was also, it was also difficult because I'm so angry and sad that this has happened. And most of all, I was nervous because I have a terrible fear that if I'm not careful, well, suddenly hear a loud and rather badly articulated shout of boring. <laughs> from somewhere around. Because Jane hated more than anything, um, anything that smacked of pretension or sentimentality or went on too long, so I'll try. Um, and I can't cover all the things that I should. I've also tried, I've been asked to try to be descriptive rather than anecdotal about Jamie, and that's hard. Uh, but there'll be a chance for some good stories over the road later. I thought I'd try not to talk at all about myself, but even that's hard because I think all of us remember Jamie in relationship to our, our experience of him. When I popped down yesterday to a very sad MTC, everyone wanted to talk to me about Jamie, and not only about his artistry, but more than everything, more than that, someone had, everyone had a story about their relationship with Jamie. Some of them were close to him, others were not. He wasn't that gregarious, it were. But they all felt equally connected to him. Um, a beautiful man, said one. I loved him when he used to come and chat to me as he passed my desk. I never knew what he was saying, but I loved him. <laughs> <laughs> I've known Jamie for an awful long time, um, as long as many people, most people, so not all people in this church, um, since we're friends at school in Hobart. And I can't say he changed drastically in that time. His art got a bit better. He designed the light in my first ever production, a play called, for some unbelievable reason, Universal Plumbery, 
and, he, and then he lit my most recent production, I call art, at the, at the art centre, and I think we both got a bit better by then. Um, his acerbic wit, his love of practical joke, his dislike, his dislike of anything too pompous were well and truly in evidence by the time I met him. And the apparent shyness that doesn't or didn't quite fit with the fact that he had such an enormous number of close friends. He already enjoyed a drink, and I think the word enjoyed is the most accurate description. Um, he's claimed to me occasionally that my mother introduced him to the joys of a glass of beer, but I don't really believe that. Uh, I have memories, and I hope his mother, Judy, will forgive me for revealing this, of Jamie initiating me and Peter Salmon at the age of 16 into the beneficial effects of a bottle of rum on Saturday morning at the uh, Hobart Reservoir. Come to, think, come to think of it, that's one thing that has changed. I don't think I've seen Jamie with a rum and coke. Um, although I firmly believe the theatre was where Jamie belonged, he got sidetracked for a while into television. Another stupid coincidence, we both applied for a new a two-year television directing traineeship at the ABC. They were going to give one to each state, but for some reason they decided to offer one to both Jamie and I, so one of us had to leave Hobart, and it was Jamie who went to Perth, which became his relationship with, began his relationship with that city. He became a television director, and I, uh, and I believe he was very good at it, although I do wonder sometimes about the interesting moments that the vision mixers and Cameron must have had hanging on his instructions during the live program. It wasn't long before he'd given that up, had gone to London where he developed his craft and knowledge of lighting at the Strand Electric Prospect Theatre and where he gathered another group of friends, very close friends who loved him. Then back to Perth to the National Theatre and finally in 1973 to the MTC which became his home for 27 years. I spoke to John Sumner on Monday night and he, he asked me to read out a brief message. When Jamie joined the MTC in the 1970s he not only took an enormous load off my shoulders but more importantly he so improved the standard of the company's light and design. What a relief to have his creativity in technical rehearsals and sometimes his wicked humour. Um, I'd substitute the word always for sometimes. Although maybe John meant he sometimes enjoyed his humour and sometimes didn't. <laughs> I'll come to his artistry um, as shown by his hundreds of productions that he lived at the MTC and, and many outside gigs, particularly in VSO and other companies. But there are a few other aspects to be talked about first. His extraordinary, extraordinary and generous ability to pass on his knowledge to younger designers and technicians. So many of whom regard him as, as, as their mentor and who are now working throughout the country in all kinds of capacities and, and most of them here today. His legendary efficiency and ability to work quickly without sacrificing qualities. I found the easiest way to break the ice in any theatre in the country was to mention that you knew Jamie, the lighting operator, you immediately got stories of how he was in such and such a show in 19 something or other, and how beautiful the lighting was, but also how quickly and cleverly he did the focus, or how many cues he plotted in, in an hour or something. Then there are the other anecdotes as well, about how he stayed up all night sharing a few beers and then return, returned to work in the morning as fresh as ever, or, or about some acerbic and unrepeatable, in this place, remark he made to or about some person that the crew disliked. His love of the MTC, not unconditional, he hated it when the shows weren't good or when someone was working there that he didn't um, much like. I've lost my page. Here we go. Um, but he loved it nevertheless. And his value to the company was far more than with his lighting. He acted as a kind of unpaid technical consultant. Uh, whenever we were thinking of new developments at Russell Street, Fairfax, or the long running saga of the new theatre, Jamie would be the one that would um, disappear into the night, come back with a brilliant computer. Uh, having worked out brilliantly on a computer, uh, the solution to some problem or, in fact, a new suggestion. His knowledge of the theatre as a whole was greater than anyone I've ever known. His impeccable taste, he played his cards close to his chest. His stoic behaviour at rehearsals became the stuff of legend. Uh, Jamie laughed twice during the run-through. Uh, <laughs> we'd go rapidly around the building. We knew we, were, we had a show that was going to be riotously funny. <laughs> Jamie told the, the end the show was going to be all right, which meant we had a hit. Um, mind you, he never tell you to your face. I don't think he ever said to me that he liked anything that I'd done at the time. I'd find out a year or two later over a beer when he reminisced, reminisced about how great such and such a show was. This behaviour was occasionally misconstrued by young directors or actors new to the company as indifference or cynicism, but they were wrong. He missed the point of this unusual, but unusual but incredibly generous man. He hated sentimentality, but could get sentimental himself. 
He disliked praise, took no notice of reviews. He was always apparently embarrassed when I gave him an opening night card thanking him for his work, but I think he probably liked it really. And what an incredible work it was. Writing of function and beauty. Never drawing inappropriate attention to itself, but always perfectly attuned to the production's needs, and invariably adding so much. His instinct was to paint with light, building up picture lamp by lamp. lamp. He was known as other great lighting designers have been known as the Prince of Darkness. But he was also capable of and enjoyed working differently with bold, theatrical, non-naturalistic light. The theatre is the most ephemeral art. There's really no record of what we do, apart from the reviews, invariably silly or inadequate to the task of describing what it was like to be in the theatre that night, or videos of production which always look horrible, as this video will no doubt look. No, our only record is in the memories of people of things they have seen. And everyone in this church will have memories of magical moments in the theatre that stem from Jamie's artistry. You'll forgive me if mine are to do with productions I directed, because I am immeasurably grateful to have worked with such a great artist. The blinding light derived from some old car headlights that he'd found on Peter Carroll's white shirt and razor as he prepared to cut another customer in Sweeney Todd. Blazing sunlight greeting the convicts from the First Fleet when they arrived in Australia in our country's good. The dust storm at the beginning of the Grapes of Wrath. The incredibly magic and beautiful lighting of the dinner party scene in the Fifth Night Museum. The moment at the end of the art where the white painting glowed and shimmered. These are all moments that um, owe everything to Jamie and his artistry. Our sympathy goes to Jamie's family, whom he loved so much, and to his innumerable friends who loved him and whose lives he enriched so much, and to the company he loved, and to the Australian theatre, which has lost far too soon one of its greats. <clears throat>
and feeling. <clears throat> I'm one of the thousands of actors, dancers, singers, musicians, acrobats, jugglers, and performers from all facets of the entertainment industry, both in Australia and overseas, who have had the privilege and the pleasure of being lit by Jamie Lewis, or not lit, as the case might be. <laughs> A small percentage here of us today would now like to remind you of a minute part of Jamie's immense body of work. Like the man himself, it was extraordinary. 1973, Don's party, the last of the Knucklemen, all my sons. 1974, Equus, Coralie Lansdowne says no. 1975, The Lady from the Sea. 1976, Of Mice and Men, Othello, and Diary of a Madman. City Sugar. 1977, Summer of the Seventeenth Doll, The Club. Desire Under the Elms. 1978, Break and Morant, Departmental. Under Milton. 1979, Macbeth. 1980, once a cat. Cinderella, cry that's on parade, the elephant man. Nineteen eighty one. Morning becomes Electra. Einstein, a man for all seasons. Amadeus. Nineteen eighty two. The floating world. 1983, Gulls. On our selection, Medea, to Botany Bay on a Bondi tram. 1984, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Pax Americana. 1985, The Glass Menagerie. Glen Gary. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry, Jamie. Glen Gary, Glen Ross, The Doll Trilogy, and in 1986, The One Day of the Year. Now let's see how you handle the eternal light, Jamie. The Entertainer, 1987, Twelfth Night, and Day and Death of Joey. Sweeney Todd, 1988, Europe, and The Big Men Fly. Hedda Gardner, 1989, The Recruiting Officer, and Dreams in an Empty City. 1990, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, This Old Man Comes Rolling Home, Present Laughter. 1991, The Crucible, The Taming of the Shrew, Uncle Vanya. The Selection, Shirley Valentine, High Society. 1993, M. Butterfly, Much Ado About Nothing. 1994, The Grapes of Wrath. Blabbermouth, <laughs> that's the play. Uh, 1995, Assassins, Aftershocks. 1996, Julius Caesar, Dealer's Choice in a 1997 a Little Night Music. Private Lives, 1998, Into the Woods, Absurd Person Singular. Guys and Dolls, 9, The Importance of Being Honest. 1997, The Reopening of the Regional Theatre, Yevgeny Onyekin. Il Trovatore, Pearl Fisher's Marriage of Figaro. Over 40 operas with the VSO. The Irish and how they got that way. She loves me. Rigoletto. 1999. Pride and Prejudice. 2000. Company. And 2001. Art. Thank you, Jamie. And Jamie was looking forward to doing Always Patsy Klein with Deborah Conway. Thank you, Jamie. It is strange to remember Jamie, knowing there'll be no more memories to come. Strange to say I was his niece. When last Monday it was I am. It is hard to speak of Jamie, like an old familiar book, just read and closed. Harder still is to say he'll never. Say this, go there, do that.
do that again. To think that all is done forever, and memories of him all which remain. Sadness indeed are those words unsaid of gratitude and joy and love held back too awkward now he's dead but he knew he knows he was content how many hearts and pubs be empty without his incoherent mumbles how will a pint of guinness slip between our lips without jamie in our minds how will i forget that bigoted grin which egged me on no end or that faded ginger chin that hid his ruddy face. It hurts to believe Jamie's dead, a complex, simple man, an uncle, father, brother, son, a friend and supporting hand. But how beautiful it is to remember Jamie, who he was for me and you, and how all our Jamies are a tad different and all of us a little changed because the Jamie we knew. I'm Meg Lewis, Jamie's eldest niece. Uncle Jamie was there when I was born. Well, at least he was at the pub across the road, <laughs> celebrating the new arrival. He was also there when I learned to crawl. But he wasn't watching. He was too busy having staff for breakfast with Dad. In fact, they were so busy drinking staff, they didn't notice that I crawled till I was eating spittoon, cigarettes out of the spittoon at the pub. <laughs> He was also there at nearly all my birthdays, even though the present wasn't. It did come several months later though. In fact, I think we're still awaiting on Christmas. Recently for my 21st birthday, I received a homebrew kit which we were about to embark on in a few weeks time. <laughs> Jamie came to speech nights, he came to school plays, and tried not to snore, thank God, because if you've ever heard him snoring, it's a relief if he just doesn't snore. However, most of these events were accompanied by the single malt in the hip flask, but he still came and you knew he was proud. I remember finding my first silver with Uncle Jamie on a camping trip. We split open a rock and there it was. I remember Uncle Jamie and Dad giving me too much champagne when Australia won the America's Cup. I was so drunk I couldn't stand up. I was only three. <laughs> I remember Christmas times with Uncle Jamie dressed up as Father Christmas, somewhat believable because of his beard. Uncle Jamie used to tell ghost stories. He believed in ghosts. I'm sure all of you have heard about the ghost that haunts his bedroom, the ghost at Mulwira, or the nannies that haunt old Scottish houses. I wasn't sure I believed in ghosts then, but maybe I do now. I remember a fantastic uncle who, as we got older, became more of a best friend. We had beers at the pub, and sometimes he even had a rum and coke just for me. He phoned just to see what I was doing, rang when Dad was so drunk I had to come and pick him up. I became Uncle Jamie and Dad's personal chauffeur once I got my licence, and especially when, when Mum was away we went on illicit drinking trips. When I went and stayed with him, he cooked me delicious food coated in European garlic. We had many laughs, or in Uncle Jamie's case, a smug little chuckle. I treasure the friendship I had with Uncle Jamie and sharing his and Dad's special times. 
There are many of my friends who don't even have half the relationship with their own fathers as I did with Uncle Jamie. And I want you all to be reminded that he isn't really gone. And the next time you've stumbled on a quaint old pub, historic rail station, basically anywhere obscure, and you're starting to think, hey, maybe I'm the first person who's ever been here before. You'll look around, because you'll hear a chuckle, and there he'll be, sitting in the corner, grinning that naughty smile, and saying, ha ha, thank you to it, I've been here before.
your care, your hand is gracious. And as the potter fashions the clay, you have formed us in your image. Through the Holy Spirit, you have breathed into us the gift of life. In the sharing of love, you have enriched our knowledge of you and of one another. We claim your love today. As we say farewell to James, commit him into your care. And certain hopes of a resurrection to eternal life. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. Kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. For the source of
Jamie. Uh, cheers. And thanks to everybody. Thank you, Chris. And what are we going to do with that dog-cooking turd? <laughs>